Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be resolving tensions between privacy and utility of health data. I'd like to welcome Robert to the stage to introduce our next panel. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm really excited to have you here and have you listen to this vital conversation on the privacy and utility of health data and the paradox at the center of this. Health data is some of the most promising data that exists and within it holds secrets and insights that could radically improve our lives by helping us understand our health better. On the other hand, health data is the most sensitive information about us. It contains our most intimate and vulnerable information. And as such, it demands privacy. And thus our paradox, there's tension between health data privacy and utility, between finding insights and respecting the dignity and privacy of individuals. And this tension is embedded within our ethical frameworks for care and research. It's codified in our legal and regulatory regime. It's been thrust into the public discourse in the past months during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we discuss things like contract tasting, immunity passports, uh, research on medical records and, and um, the hydroxychloroquine research that was published, done on uh, medical records, mass diagnostic testing. And we've struggled to find appropriate policies for this, with the policy discourse inevitably devolving into another debate on the merits of privacy and the public good, framed around this paradox of utility and privacy. But what if we can sidestep this paradox altogether? But what if we could learn from and make use of data without needing to give up our privacy? That is the subject of our discussion today, escaping the privacy and utility paradox and a radical reframing of the discourse around health data privacy. And with that, I'd like to invite our panelists on, Eric, Marielle, and Vince. Um, Vince, do you mind starting off and giving a, an introduction to yourself? Sure. Hey, great intro, Bert. Greetings from all and good morning from Boise, Idaho. Uh, I work as an independent healthcare consultant, have been involved in uh, healthcare, working with both large and small healthcare and tech companies for over 30 years. And uh, most recently with, a, with another colleague, uh, have been authoring, co-authoring a series on this issue, which we call the healthcare data uh, Goldilocks dilemma. How do you share not too much information, not too little information, but the right amount of information in, in healthcare? That's on the healthcare blog. So look forward to participating and thanks for the, the chance to be here. And Eric, do you mind introducing yourself next? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, hi everybody from, from Paris. And uh, I'm Eric, and uh, I'm a machine learning research scientist at a startup called Oaken, which is a startup in the biotech sector working on the application of uh, AI and ML methods to promote clinical research, and especially in the area of oncology. And uh, at Oaken, I lead a, a group of, uh, of researchers working on privacy preserving machine learning techniques, and specifically on a technology called federated learning. Uh, which is a method that we apply at, at Oaken to be able to train machine learning models across uh, privately held uh, patient data. Dr. Gross. Hey there, I'm Marielle Gross. I'm an OBGYN and a bioethicist, uh, starting now at University of Pittsburgh and also continuing my work at Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. As um, a researcher, my, my work has really focused on ethics of evidence in women's healthcare and specifically how we can leverage our new technological systems as well as our legal frameworks that Vince and Eric respectively work on um, to optimize evidence in women's healthcare. At the same time, as a gynecologist, my entire practice has been focused on and attuned to how to maintain dignity through privacy and sensitivity to how we treat women's bodies as well as their information to optimize their care as well as their sort of moral status. And so that's what brings me to this conversation. I'm very excited to be here. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm really excited for the conversation. Uh, as a, a quick background, I, I guess I should introduce myself. 
Um, I'm Robert Miller, Director of Product Management Strategy at a company called Consensus Health. Uh, we work with enterprises to solve problems of collaboration and privacy in health data. Um, and Vince, I'm gonna kick this discussion to you to sort of set the stage. You know, where are we? Um, what, what is health data? What should people know about their health data and privacy? Okay, I'm gonna share a couple of slides and uh, keep this really simple if I can find the right buttons to push. There we go. Okay. So uh, if you can see the slides, great. If you can't, I think the voiceover hopefully will be enough. Uh, this is from a McKinsey study recently. They, they looked at the issue of how much health and medical data does an average person generate in their lifetime. And so I've put that, uh, think of this box as all of your lifetime of health data, 1,100 terabytes is estimated by McKinsey. And then uh, this is more of a United States point of view, but I think it, uh, it frames the, the issue from uh, a policy and a legal perspective uh, protected by HIPAA in, in, US, in the US. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability uh, Accountability, and uh, it is legislation that actually does a pretty good job of protecting privacy when data was, is within the, the, the healthcare and the medical system. And of that 1,100 terabytes, 0.4 terabytes in the very bottom left, the green area, is the amount of data that is actually protected by uh, HIPAA regulations in, in the US. So uh, as the data that is not protected by HIPAA, and I wanted to give you a visualization of this, uh, data that is outside of the healthcare system becomes much more important. Data here would include uh, a wide range of devices, thermometers, pulse oximeters, blood pressure, cuffs, watches, uh, fitness equipment, cameras. It would include your data around your activity, weight, health status, food, eating habits, sleep, sexual activities. All this is health-related data. And then uh, how many M Health or mobile health apps are there with the, the latest count done by a company called Research to Guidance? found 325,000 mobile healthcare apps that you can choose from. Now, if you find this point of view expansive, there's even a more expansive way of looking at this is all of your data is health data, that any data, your financial data, uh, anything can be used to make inferences about your, your health. Uh, so that's the first perspective broadly that I wanted to uh, share with you. I think the, the second perspective, again, from a U.S. point of view, is uh, how shareable is this data? And in the past, uh, the issue has really been electronic health records have not been very interoperable. The, uh, the federal government uh, within the U.S., the uh, Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services this year have finalized regulations that I think will uh, begin to put that in to an end. And the, the short answer is, is that uh, what's being mandated is essentially interoperable APIs that you've seen in pretty much every other aspect of industry. The, the acronym in healthcare is FHIR, F-H-I-R, F -H -I -R, FAST, Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Uh, they take effect in about two years. And we, uh, I would expect, will see the kinds of data that you have seen uh, shared uh, and frankly hoovered up by the large tech companies uh, be available now within the healthcare and the and the health realm, and that's that's really a, a legal and an ethical issue. 
The, the third angle that I'll mention a bit about this is just to give a sense of legal protections and where we are with that. And uh, I speak as a lawyer in, in a past life, but the, the answer really is not very legalistic. We're, we're in the wild west, and if your data is not protected within the narrow realm that I showed you earlier of being protected by HIPAA, then today in the US, it's largely completely unprotected. Last year, there were nine different comprehensive privacy bills that were proposed in the US Congress. But like the rest of the world, because of, of the COVID crisis, uh, nothing is getting legislated. But I do expect that it will come back. And I think we'll talk later on a little bit more about the status of different kinds of privacy regulations in the US. But for right now, the, the answer, the short answer at least, is there, there really isn't uh, any kind of privacy regulation in effect. So that's the three minute overview. And you know, I'll close with the sentence, really all your data is health data. Thanks, Vince. I, th I think that was a, a great visualization of the, the red box, the data that you have that is protected by HIPAA and is thus afforded with special legal and ethical protections to it. And that data is produced in the context of the normal healthcare system, right? When you go to a hospital or if you have information held by an insurer, but everything outside of that, uh, the 95% of your health information that is outside of that is not afforded any special protection. So I, I have a, an Uro ring here that takes my um, body temperature and uh, as well as some, some other interesting things. And I always found- It looks a little high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably is. I'm, I'm speaking. Um, and the, the the astounding thing to this always for me was is that the information that this Uro ring is taking from my body um, is not afforded in a special or legal protection. Mm -hmm. But if I had my body temperature taken in a hospital just down the street, a, a totally different set of rules would apply then. Um, but you know, increasingly, the kind of, this kind of information is being taken outside of the normal healthcare system, and, and so it's not afforded those special legal and ethical protections that, that HIPAA normally gives. Um, yep. and, and now I want, I want to transition a little bit to some of the technology solutions that we might have. And Eric, as, as a technologist working on these problems of, of privacy preserving technology in healthcare data, what are the some of the things that you think can aid us in this tension and what are the, the technologies that you're working on? Yeah, sure. So I would say first, uh, one thing to keep in mind, my particular cross section of experience of this is really in the machine learning realm. So there are a lot of techniques which one can apply just in general to analysis of data or, or how to protect the privacy of certain data, um, uh, which, which uh, I can't really speak to so much. But um, for the machine learning aspect, um, there's a lot of really exciting developments that have been happening over the past uh, several years, and which open up a, a lot of new avenues for uh, what one can do in the application of machine learning to privately held data. And which uh, actually, if you have uh, Android devices, um, uh, if you have your phone plugged in at night, actually, you are probably contributing to build some of the most advanced uh, machine learning models over the largest data set that ever existed, um, which is all of your um, personal text message data. So um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the techniques that's really been popularized over the past uh, several years um, is a technique called uh, federated learning. So, um, so federated learning is a, is a method um, for training uh, machine learning models uh, over data without moving that data. So I guess in the first case, maybe I should speak a little bit about how machine learning is carried out today and, and where it could be useful. So, so a lot of uh, businesses today um, are finding ways of using the data that they have on hand. Um, and one great way to use that is, is, through, is through machine learning. So what this offers up is the ability to create predictive models. So, um, so you say, uh, okay, here's a program, take a look at all of this data that we have stored here. Uh, train uh, train an approach which can predict some outcome. So, you know, in a financial markets, right, predict whether or not that price is going to go up or down. 
In the case of health data, it's about detecting and finding patterns inside this health data to understand disease um, by and large. Um, and so this is a really important part for helping um, clinical researchers understand um, uh, and find, find patterns that they might not have seen before in the data that they're looking at. Um, and these methods can be applied to uh, clinical records, um, say, say just a, maybe text data, like a big spreadsheet uh, that, that talks about uh, your health and, and, uh, and your life. But it can also be applied to very complex data, such as images or video or 3D medical imaging volumes. So there's a lot of application for machine learning um, with a lot of landmark papers um, uh, that have come out to show the utility of these sorts of techniques. Um, but the big challenge for all of these is to run and train these methods. You have to put the data where the, where the programming is, where the process runs. Um, and what that means to date is um, releasing your data to some centralization. So um, uh, in, the, in, the case of, in the case of a big, big tech company, maybe they come in, they, they, they take some of your data, maybe your browsing history, some other things that they can track and run these analysis techniques, uh, train some machine learning models on it, on their servers. Um, uh, because if you don't have the data in hand, you can't run the, run the process on it. But what is happening now um, is, is a pivot towards doing this computation, not in vast data centers that are centralized, but rather um, what's called on the edge, uh, on, um, on devices. So close to where the data is actually produced. And what this affords us is an opportunity to uh, train the same kinds of models that are just as impactful, but without ever moving data from its original source. And there's a lot of advancement in the techniques of, of how to do that, um, but they're becoming more and more effective. And um, in some cases can demonstrate uh, that, hey, you can have the same level of performance for the, for the kind of approach you want to use, all while keeping the data um, at its source. And uh, overall, this is a big win for, for individual privacy and a big impact in the health sector where moving data um, is, is a big challenge because moving data implies copying data. Data can be copied, it can be reused um, uh, and uh, you know, without consent. So, uh, so being able to keep the data there, having the technologies to, to do all of this uh, state-of-the-art processing without moving the data, it's a big, big opportunity. And um, I just want to remind the folks that are watching, feel free to enter in questions and um, some of our helpful colleagues that are organizing this conference will gather them together and you can upvote different questions in the, the Slido as well. And we'll take some time at the end of this session uh, to ask our panelists about them. So it, Eric, I think you, you said that um, on my Android smartphone today, I'm participating in this federated learning network, right? And there's uh, every everything I type helps autocorrect get a little bit smarter, but my uh, the text that I write isn't sent to Google, just the algorithm is. And over millions of devices, that's aggregated together to to make autocorrect that much better, while preserving individual privacy. And then taking that decentralized machine learning technology and, and applying it to healthcare is, is what your company does. Um, so that that's a really interesting approach to you know, resolving this tension between privacy and utility. And you know, Vince was talking about the policy reforms that might um, help us resolve this tension. And Eric laid out some technology solutions. And Dr. Gross, you've talked to me before about um, a part of this process that's even before the technology, let alone the policy, it, it goes back to how we think about and create data um, and a, a novel proposal um, on data creation. Can you speak a little bit about your thoughts there? Yeah, thanks, um, Robert and Eric and Vince. It's just, it's exciting to see how all of our work kind of comes together from these very unique angles. So, you know, as a practicing clinician, I'll give some examples, uh, I think, to illustrate what I'm, you know, how I've been thinking about this from very concrete um, settings. So I'll start with an, an obstetrical setting. So I'm doing a study of records uh, prenatal records, looking for bias or disrespectful language. And imagine a group of, you know, hun you know hundreds of, of history and physical notes, which is the sort of standard medical or hospital admission to the hospital note. 
And these are all women who are coming to the hospital in labor to have their baby. And so a number of them are showing up um, with their, you know, their quote unquote chief complaint, which is a term we could talk about some other time, um, is that they've, they've broken their water. And, uh, but I'm reading note after note after note and seeing that instead of saying just clear fluid at 7 a.m., it's saying, you know, I woke, it, it's the history, history of present illnesses. I woke up in a puddle and it was running down my legs and my underwear were soaked and I thought I urinated on myself and all these other details, truly reporting what the woman said. Um, but after note after note, realizing none of this was clinically relevant. And yet it, by encoding it in the history and physical uh, note, it becomes a part of her medical record. And so this very private moment that as an OBGYN, we have this you know, therapeutic bond and a privilege of being in the room during these incredibly you know, intimate um, exams and delivering of their child, for example. We're, part, we're like privileged to be part of that. And at the same time, we're, get, we're privy to information about them that really never needs to leave that room. And yet it's leaving that room, it's going into the medical record. And then I started to think, what about this woman coming back you know, a year later, she's going to see an orthopedic surgeon for an ankle procedure. And they look at her last history and physical note and they need to, they, do they really need to see that she woke up in a puddle? And how that might start sort of creates this, I got this sense of how this information that we create um, in, a, in a medical context is gratuitous. It's not clinically relevant. And it serves to a number of different you know, types of information can fit this bill. That's just one very visceral example, how you could see how this totally, you know, following the form that we were taught as medical students, how to write a note and say what the patient said is the history of present illness, how lack of um, editing of that information, uh, lack of focus on what's actually clinically relevant creates a tremendous vulnerability in the data set that we're creating. And then everybody down the line can then subsequently have access to that information. And it's as though the patient, perhaps without knowing it or realizing it, is you know having a, a, a virtual pelvic exam every time she goes to see a clinician from henceforth, because everyone who is in her medical record can open this note and then immediately be back in that very vulnerable moment, which was meant to be just between her and her doctor um, at, that, at that point. So that's one example of where I started to really think about how the the conceptual models for how we think about encoding information in a clinical setting, especially in these highly sensitive settings, can really dramatically influence the level of vulnerability we create in the health information itself. Like something that makes that health information where our, where our ethical and moral intuitions start from, what makes that information um, sensitive and important to protect the privacy of it, is something that we, we, we sort of come up with before the medical records and is sort of taken on a whole new meaning with medical records existence and then medical records existence in the way that we have them now. And this interoperability, the fire, sort of the, the potential to just magnify any vulnerability that we create in the record really brings to me attention on how important it is to really curate that information as the clinician on the ground. Um, another huge example, so that has to do with the actual, the narrative content of the notes. Another brief example I can give is in the structure of the notes. So the same thing when you use it, Epic or Cerner, for example, uh, which are these major medical record um, uh, systems, you and you go in any in any clinical context to write a note or a history and physical note about a patient or a consult note. There, it's this great thing that they do. They they auto populate the patient's medical history, their surgical history, all these different details that you as a clinician used to have to write in, and now they're auto populated for you. Um, but what happens if your clinical history includes uh, chlamydia or an abortion? The same thing happens almost on a structural systemic level where every time you go to see a clinician, this history of a, you know, we, of conditions that we know are sensitive and stigmatizing and totally irrelevant to say that same orthopedic surgeon are getting populated in. And sort of creating this new vulnerability unintentionally through the the intention is to you know make um, things more interoperable faster to make things easier on the clinicians and better for patients because of this you know continuous access to information about that patient they don't have to repeat their whole history etc cetera, etc cetera. but the interesting thing about having the patient repeat their history in that individual setting and having the clinician in that setting record it is that you get to focus on what's actually clinically relevant and so it's a combination of this lack of clinical relevance and lack of discretion 
that our current healthcare systems and uh, medical record systems in particular, as well as those who are using them have, that I think really create two, two very distinct but related vulnerabilities for all patients. Of course, in my setting where we deal with these very, you know, sort of this, this is, speaks to how I feel like, even though we have people like Vince that are true experts in health law and privacy and ethics of privacy, my ethical expertise, you know, is coming from a different angle, but it's really that my clinical experience that has informed me about how easily it is we just run roughshod over, over people's most private moments in the attempt to really modernize and make care better for them. And one last thing I'll just mention is, uh, I don't need to kind of illustrate, but another really good example of this is how we use something like urine toxicology in a clinical setting and how that also opens the door, not just to vulnerability from a personal privacy standpoint, but vulnerability on you know, levels of, of ethics, of law, when you involve, when it's a pregnant woman, for example, or a recently pregnant woman, it can involve custody of her child. And so even just ordering that test needs to have this extra layer of you know really intentional thought because of how those tests are encoded and then propagated shared etc so i'll kind of leave it at that I and mean, said a lot of a lot of information to take but i i definitely see the importance of thinking about things the way that vince and eric have been um, what they can add so that we can collaborate on making our health systems more private without sacrificing the value that we gain by being able to share our information and record it digitally and I, I think that's particularly interesting, these returning to what Vince had laid out for us before. There are these certain parts of our healthcare system that we give extra ethical and legal protections to our information in, and then a large part where we don't. But you are even narrowing down on the part where we do have extra ethical and legal protections and saying within that, we need to be mindful of how we um, curate information how that information is uh, is populated in, in automatic forms in the um, orthopedic surgery example that you gave um, and the ways in which I, I think what you're hinting at it too is, is almost letting people um, alter their information and remove that extremely intimate and vulnerable moment that isn't clinically relevant from, from their medical record. I wanna just make a slight, oh, I realized I forgot to take myself off mute. So that's, that's good. I wanna make a slight modification. It's not about removal. Um, and I, this is something that we've discussed extensively and happy to speak with anybody about in our work on de-identified data. And that I wanna make a distinction between what it means to delete something, which is sort of the traditional way of, we think about quote, removing data is deleting it. Um, that's where this whole idea of, you know, the right to be forgotten in healthcare comes up which is that I used to think that that wasn't a thing, right? GDPR, many of you may be familiar with this concept of the right to be forgotten. And when I first learned about it, I was like, okay, that doesn't have a meaning in healthcare because the benefits of not forgetting seem to so outweigh the benefits of forgetting. I would never, you know, a patient asking me on leaving the hospital, okay, now delete my whole medical record. We would never go for that, right? And the truth is, it's not that simple because what we show people through the medical record, what we record, it's, it's more about what we don't record, things that are not clinically relevant, that are potentially harmful, that have that serve no purpose except to sort of either entertain at the very least or you know, objectify or denigrate at the worst our patients. And so it's what we don't record. And then at the same time, it's how we selectively display and interact with that data rather than say we delete that you ever had chlamydia or that you ever had a procedure um, to terminate a pregnancy. Although I would say with that example, it's more about what we need to think about what the relevant procedure is, not what it was done for. So you could have the same, it's another example of how you can keep the clinical relevance while removing as much as possible the stigmatizing and moralizing components of that. So not what we delete or don't keep, but how we show it and what we decide is important to keep in the first place. Uh, and Mary Ellen, you, you mentioned the, the issue of de-identified data. Uh, to, to, uh, I used a, a highly legal, legalistic term in describing 
the protections under uh, U.S. law of HIPAA as pretty good protections. That's where the qualification really, I think, comes in, in that uh, there's certainly been a lot of criticism. And in short, but I think pretty accurately, is once data is de-identified and de-identification in this case means it's uh, it's stripped of 18 potential identifiers, uh, then it's free game for anybody. You can sell that data, uh, you can you know give it away on the internet, you, you uh, and people can do whatever much they pretty much want. Uh, you know there are positive aspects of that in that it's uh, certainly useful for clinical research, but again it's a, a huge uh, loophole. It's more like a, you know a crater of uh, a challenge to people's privacy, and one of the you know, one of the risks is around certainly being able to re-identify data, uh, which is very easily very easy in the in the healthcare uh, aspect. If you're, uh, I mean, just to give an example, uh, let's say you are uh, someone with uh, prostate cancer, and you live and you're 67 years old, and you live in zip code 90423. You know, your name may not be attached to that piece of data, but it's pretty easy to re-identify that kind of information. Very, very, very easy. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to point out that almost all um, medical research or commercial activity involving health data today takes place on de-identified data. Um, I don't have a particular number for it, but it is pretty close to the majority, if not all, of that activity. Um, but, but there is, I don't know, one of the examples that I think here is worth a good place to interject it in is the, uh, the relationship that Google has recently struck with uh, Ascension Healthcare System. And uh, unclear, but are also potentially with uh, Mayo and other large healthcare systems. So the, the article that came out last November in the Wall Street Journal pointed out, okay, Ascension is a large multi-hospital system in the United States, and they have data on about 50 million patients. They've struck a deal with Google. It's called the Nightingale Project, if you want to do some research on it. And that uh, through a backdoor of what's known as a, a business associate agreement, that the data that is being held by Ascension Healthcare System is now going to be shared with Google uh, as a business associate partner, and it will be identified data. Uh, the positive clinical aspect of that is, is that the intention is to essentially uh, layer this over the existing electronic health record and be able to provide potentially real-time clinical alerts, which uh, could be extremely valuable to, to clinicians. Uh, it's not just data in the EHR any longer. It's now recommendations that have been formed by uh, evidence-based medicine and uh, AI algorithms that have been run on top of that by Google and provided to clinicians on, on a real-time basis. Uh, yet it's unprecedented that a large tech company has access to 50 million identified health records. I mean, that's the state of uh, the controversy, I think, that we're, that we're in right now. It's a great example. And I'd be, I'd be curious of other, how others would see this particular example. Yeah, it's a it's it's a really interesting point, um, and and it's it's funny because uh, when when this project was was publicized, I, I don't remember if it was via announcement or leak. Um, it was leaked. Uh, when it, yeah, or when it originally at least came out, the Wall out. Street Journal reported right. it. There was a whistle. And, it, it, it wasn't just leaked; it was an internal Google employee. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So so with uh, so with these things so. So obviously, you know, there, there's big challenges. And I think what it speaks to is not even just, you know, this one project. Obviously, you know, the name Google raises a lot of specters, right? Um, uh, especially here in the EU. Uh, but 
uh, you know, it's it's one it's one symptom of a greater challenge, which is you know once that data is there, once it's in these record systems, um, and you know those record systems, uh, how how are they reusing that data and reselling it? Because it's not just um, with with big tech, because I mean here maybe there's a very interesting use case for it in terms of um, maybe there's a there's a nice service that could be provided to clinicians, but also too this is the same sort of, of deal can happen to provide data um, to other other actors in the, in the biotech sector, whether that's a pharmaceutical company or a CRO acting on behalf, you know, and, and those kinds of questions, again, you know, if it's a pharma coming in, uh, also collecting data in the same way from the same record systems with money changing hands, you know, it's something where one could say it's a, it's a general good you know, if, you know, we're developing novel treatments for, you know, using this data, but it's a big challenge in terms of consent and what people's expectations are in terms of how their health records are being used and, and where they can be used. And um, this is something where a lot of um, uh, privacy preserving technologies um, can really help, uh, not just in terms of keeping that data away from, from other actors, but in being able to allow individuals to control their own data, to control what they consent to uh, with, with their data. And, um, you know, because these kinds of activities might even be something as individuals, we might say, you know, actually for, for me, with this level of access on my records, actually, um, that would be, you know, I don't mind my data being used for this use or for that use, but maybe I don't want it being used for this other use. So being able to have that sort of nuanced control over, over how your data can be used and to have the understanding on the individual level of where that data is going and, and to whom is a way to avoid these explosions um, of, of great, great blowback for, for, uh, for, for companies if they are trying to produce an, an honest good. You know? uh, yeah, I, I want to kind of, that's, that's really interesting. I want to kind of point out that this whole de-identified data structure that's you know the loophole that Vince you know illuminated was really created you know at least in if we give it benefit of the doubt was created to advance for this very purpose of advancing learning while minimizing um, the trade-off between sharing data and privacy it actually comes from exactly where this tension um, this appreciation of the tension between the trade-off of data and, and privacy and the benefits that we can get as a collective, from that data and realizing the value of our data in aggregate um, before we realized before we knew that we could gain that utility without needing to aggregate the aggregate utility without needing to aggregate the data itself so before we knew about the things that eric is teaching us about um, and that that's really where it came from the so a good intention that sort of no longer fits with what we now know about how that data can be moved and used. And I want to point out two other things. So one is that, you know, the whole assumption of, I, I want to challenge the assumption that the, the way that people are, the way that people view their data as being compromised or harmful when it's shared is via um, not being identified. And I think what we've made clear is that when you're that one little box and all the other data about you is out there, you know, for free, the, tri the ability to triangulate and re-identify subjects based on these extensive sets of data we have about everybody now has virtually eliminated the potential for simple de-identification to truly do its purpose of protecting privacy, of preventing re-identification. Uh, re There's two other points though that are really important, which is one that, that doesn't prevent group harms at all. So we may never need to re-identify you, Eric or Robert, um, but we can still, you know, do things in whether it's through society policies different things to marginalize and harm you and other people like you in your area and so of course there are tremendous vulnerabilities here and we think especially about how this data is used say in in, in insurance and different things that have you know redlining and racial sort of stigmatization and socioeconomic exclusionary principles that don't even need to re-identify a specific person in order to create harms for the whole group based on their very same data. The other things that I think is important to recognize is that the benefits that people have or potential benefits that they can get out of their data or the harms related to it, I think extend beyond, we need to recognize how they extend beyond 
the um, simply not being identified. So like my capacity to benefit from my data, not just my capacity to be harmed when it's released to, um, to others is also taken away when you de-identify me. Um, and then the last point I'll make is about the, the vast asymmetries between what you were describing, Eric, as something where an individual would have some sort of meaningful control over what kind of uses of their data are allowed and what kind of uses aren't. And I think that that's actually a great example of how something like a data union, which those in the audience and radical exchange um, folks may have been exposed to, is this idea that, you know, expecting any individual to sort of know the content and make those relevant decisions. Um, not only is just not helpful because of the vast asymmetries and power and knowledge over data and how it's used, including with researchers themselves, but also just how that functions practically for any individual. And so it really shows the need for this expert second level to negotiate those sorts of things. But I, I definitely see that role there emerging from this, from this, from this issue as you uh, illuminated it. We're coming up, we have 10 minutes until the end of the session. And so I, I want to turn to the audience, audience's questions. Um, if you haven't entered them already and, and you have some, please feel to enter them into, I think it's the Slido interface or, or the Zoom. And um, we'll make sure to, to get your questions and, and try to answer them here. The, the first question, the highest priority is from Maria. She asks, is the Google and Apple protocol solution for most of the contact tracing apps deployed so far truly privacy preserving? Vince, you're on mute. Hey, Vince, you're on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, I follow that issue pretty closely, so I'd like to take a whack at that. Uh, and I'm not a technical person, but I would say 80% of uh, the critiques I've read say that the, that the Google Apple technology is highly privacy preserving. And the 10 or 20% of people who uh, point out that there are still ways you can crack it are really coming up with what I think are, are pretty bizarre scenarios of uh, potential privacy risks. I think the bigger issue there is, uh, in, in my opinion, I think there are two Achilles heels to what Apple and Google are doing. It's, it's extremely well-intentioned, but I think it's largely likely to be uh, inconsequential. Uh, first is the network math just doesn't work. Uh, in, the, in the case, I'll give you an example of Iceland, that has the highest percentage of adoption at 38% last statistic I saw. It doesn't mean 38% of the people now get notifications. It means uh, to do the network math, you've got to have two people actually that have downloaded the math. So the way that the math works is you take 38%, 0.38, multiply that by another 0.38 to get the probability of two people that ha have the app installed and you come up with 14.4% probability. And uh, in the US, uh, latest survey I saw 70% of people would not install this app. So with very low utilization and adoption, uh, the, the, the value of this is, uh, is pretty low. Uh, the second Achilles heel around the Google and Apple uh, exposure notification app is that uh, they've largely, I think, not paid attention to public health agencies. And so uh, public health agencies uh, within the U.S., five states out of 50 are going to be trying the methodology. Uh, in 20 some countries are going to be trying it. Uh, but I think that the, the public health agencies are not getting the kind of data that they really need, which is frankly very sensitive data around location, but that's how you do contact tracing. So uh, that's my quick take on what, what Google and Apple are doing. And, and maybe the, the headline is ironically that uh, it is too privacy preserving to be truly useful in a very uh, uh, critical process of, of contact tracing, which requires uh, running down people's identities. Thanks, Vince. 
Um, and again, you see this tension between privacy and utility, and it seems like you're highlighting that public health authorities think we've leaned too much into, into privacy and not as much utility. And the, the next question that was asked was from an anonymous person. And I think I can answer this pretty quickly. They, they ask model training still needs to happen by having centralized storage of data, um, right? And we're talking about algorithm deployment being decentralized. This is referring to, to federated learning. Um, and actually federated learning does decentralized training of models where the data is never shared with a central party and instead algorithms are trained um, in a decentralized way on your local device or your computer. Um, and only the algorithm is shared with other participants. So we have, we have like a lot of interesting questions. So I'm gonna try and get through some of them. Um, from another anonymous person, what are the implications to developing smart hospitals? Something that Microsoft is working on in the Seattle area to privacy and utility. Well, I, I suppose for, for smart hospital, it's a little bit, I mean, it's kind of a broad term and, and you know, what, do, what, does, what does this imply? Um, but just overall, um, I mean, the more data in which one has recorded and, and stored in those records, um, maybe it's useful, uh, maybe it's noise, um, but, but the more things that are there, the more it's available to, 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 to third parties. I mean, the more surface you have in, in terms of whether or not any harm can come to you from, from those systems. So uh, from my perspective, that's just why in going forward with more technologically focused approaches to, to healthcare, um, privacy preserving techniques always need to be in the discussion um, just, to, just to understand the challenges and risks that are, that are posed and to understand you know, how those can be mitigated. Uh, today, there are mitigations for, for most of those challenges, but they need to be taken seriously. Yeah, I'll offer a quick legal perspective here about current uh, US legislation, uh, really worldwide legislation puts the burden on the patients uh, to offer consent. And uh, hopefully, hopefully next year, what we really need and what I do think there is bipartisan agreement on in the US and certainly in the GDPR is the burden needs to be not just on individuals, but on the companies. What data can you gather? Uh, what are you allowed to do with it? And what are you allowed not to do with it? Uh, how long do you keep the data? Under what conditions are you allowed to delete it? And that's uh, really independent of whether you're talking about data coming from a smart hospital or a Fitbit or, or, uh, or whatever. So maybe I'm missing something in the, in the question, but I think where U.S. law needs to needs to go and likely will go because again there's agreement is uh restrictions on what is allowed to be done with the data yeah and informed consent is usually held up as the paragon way that the main way we should manage our privacy and our data but it, it really puts a huge burden on the individual um, because if you think about all the different things that all the different data sets we have to manage today it's impossible to get your head around the thousands of different devices. And there was a study done a few years ago uh, that estimated that if everyone actually read the privacy policies that they uh, checked off on the, the EULA agreements that we would be spending uh, 240 hours a year actually reading these things. No, you know, let's, let's be honest, nobody reads these things. Yeah, we all accept the cookies, so to speak which is why I think that these policies really are, um, go beyond just impl implausible to be really exploitative of those asymmetries of knowledge, expertise, time, just the interface itself. This is where embedded you know, ethics really comes in, where we need to really think about how, like what the implications of how we're structuring our interactions with each other and with these technologies as a way of, um, really rep hope, you know, creating outcomes and processes that are respectful, ethical, and effective. We, we've got uh, just under a minute left. One quick fire question, if anyone wants to, to try and answer it quick. 
Are ambitious new technologies which try to create ownership of one's data, like Herbit or other startups, a viable option? Do these projects have a future? I'm going to latch on to the word ownership uh, from a legalistic perspective and just say it really doesn't fit the notion of digital healthcare data uh, very well at all. And uh, I, so I, I think it's more of a distraction than a, than a, than a help. That's my quick fire answer back. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to the audience and to the radical exchange organizers and community. Really appreciated our vital discussion here today on health data privacy and utility. And I hope to see you next year. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody.